Hello, hello, good morning everybody. How's everyone doing? Sorry, I'm a little bit late by two minutes, but I have a good explanation. I was um, preparing, <laughs> I was preparing, it was a <laughs> last second preparation. I couldn't find an image. All right, let me tag everyone. Let's go. And also I need to, uh, where's my phone? Where'd my phone go? I need to, I need to post a thingy. Huh. My dear wife, did you steal my phone? I didn't. Can you find my phone for me, please? Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I need to make a post on Instagram, official one. Um, and I lost my phone somewhere. Hey, -o. hello, everybody. Maybe I'm sitting on it. Am I sitting on it? Anyways, I made a post on Instagram as usual. So if anyone wants to repost and help out, that'll be great. Hey, thank you so much. Um, that will help a lot. Actually, that will help a lot, a lot. So yeah, we have two minutes till we start. And um, yeah, I'm making an official post to Instagram so everyone can join. Everyone doing? Are you surviving? How's your diploma doing at the same time? As you can say, as you can see, I have my uh, looking at my phone <laughs> voice. You know when you have those friends that you have dinner with, <laughs> and then you were talking to them. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's my voice right now. All right, uh, let's go. We are live talking about all the cool stuff. Oh, ha, ha. All right, cool. All done. I hate doing that, so <sighs> put that out of the way. Today's gonna be exciting, guys, because today we're gonna be talking about storytelling, color, lighting, all that jazz. And today is the final, final lecture. We're probably gonna be here. A long time. I have no idea how today is going to go, but I think it's going to be fun. Um, I'll try to make everything as clear as possible. And internet is good, so uh, knock on wood. Tw -tw -tw. Um, yeah, the, the internet gods are blessing us on a color and light week. Yeah. What are we spamming today? I don't know, guys. What do you want? What do you want to spam today? I gonna. I gonna give you free will to do whatever you want surprise me with something original and interesting we will survive <laughs> that is a good that is a good that is a good statement I will, we will survive no 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 we will survive is kind of you know it's kind of showing that you are struggling and a good warrior never admits that he's struggling. I think the spam should be, we will conquer, we will win. We will win the battle, I don't know, something like that. Because we will survive is, you know, I don't know. You're all powerful warriors and I believe in you. So I don't think you're surviving. You're thriving. Is it challenging? Yes. Is it, is it like a Tony Stark movie montage? Assembling his iron suit? Absolutely. But was Tony Stark surviving? No. He was thriving in his situation, even though it was pretty grim. So that's you guys. Gods, God help us. Oh, no, no, no. Come on. We'll win. <laughs> Odin is with us. We can do that. Just like an Assassin's Creed trailer. All right, we're going we're gonna to wait two extra minutes. Ah, uh, so more people can come in because we did kind of start a little bit late. Um, yeah. Do 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 do. All right. I need to hide everything and then unhide one layer. Man, today is gonna be so challenging, but in a good way. I'm excited. We'll see how pull it off. <laughs> 
it's a big topic guys and we have like an hour and a half two hours to cover everything um but it will be fine growing strong i like that what about viking smash <sighs> all right i need water all right have coffee a lot of candy too all right shall we well as if the start of the week wasn't challenging enough Come on, guys. Knowledge is fun. All right, let's start. <sighs> Let me do. Oh, final. I don't know if you hear my bones cracking, but my bones are cracking. I don't know. Can you hear this? Yeah, I am preparing for battle mentally and physically. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Vikings, to lecture number 21. Today, we're going to be talking about color and light again and how to tell stories with it. Today's going to be fun for the main reason because it's the most interesting and the most personal topic for each of you guys. Why? Well, because each color and lighting scenario, you know, strikes differently in humans' hearts. And then everyone has their own color perception and associations with different colors. But before we dive in into color, uh, emotion, and how other artists use color to convey a story, we need to start simple, right? All the way from the beginning. What is color? Well, first of all, color is only seen if we have light. Without light, we have no color. It's kind of yin and yang. If you have just pure blackness and void around you, there's no color. There's nothing, right? So we always have to think about the light, right? So the light shines on something. And then when photons hit something, let's say it's a red ball, photons bounce back into our eye and there's certain wavelengths and then we register that it's red. Do you need to know the physics of light? No, the only thing that you need to know is how photons work. Photons are basically balls that, you know, um, shoot out of a light cannon and the light cannon could be anything, you know, a fire torch, a light bulb. And then what it does, it's when it hits a surface, it bounces back, it reveals its form. And then where it doesn't bounce or bounce less, there's less uh, there's less form revealed or it's going to be darker. So that's the only thing that you need to know. This is just really fast. But let's talk about color specifically. What color can do? So first of all, color has a hue. What is a hue? Well, greens, reds, blues, yellows. That is a hue. A pigment that we call. That is a hue. Then it has saturation. Right. So let's say we have a color blue, more saturated it is. It's the ultimate form, the most saturated it can get. And then when we take the pigment out, it, it stays the same value. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. And it just goes on the decrease until it becomes gray. So we have hue, saturation, and value. And what is value? Well, value, it is how dark or light the hue can become. So hue itself is just a pigment. Saturation is how much of a pigment is in there. And then value is how dark is the pigment. So technically we can take all those three color balls that are all different saturations, but the same value. And then we can make all of them darker until they go to pure black. Same thing here, right? So those are our main tools that we can manipulate up and down to manipulate our scene, right? For example, saturation. We want to make a scene more intense. What do we do? We can add super red saturated color. With hue, when we need, we need an icy path or an icy iceberg, what do we do? We take a blue hue. We want to have you know, same hue of blue, 
but it needs to be a night scene. What we can do, we can make the value go down darker and the color is gonna become darker. Scenes, the night, um, color space, right? You probably all knew that. And you know, I'm gonna reveal a little secret. You know, the HSV sliders, that's what it stands for. If someone didn't know, didn't know, you know, when I was starting first, I didn't know English. I didn't know that hue, saturation, value stood for what was stood next to those sliders. So when I reverse engineered it by myself, I was like, wow, I'm so smart. Not really. <laughs> okay, so we know what parameters. See, that's why I like color slides next to a color wheel. If you, see, if you look at my color wheel here, uh, I have a color wheel plus sliders. It's really, really useful. Uh, and that's why I like when it's, they're represented by sliders because those are actual things that we're manipulating back and forth to change the scene. Almost kind of like make more moody, make more scary. Those are the sliders that are you know, responsible for that. But how do we do it? And that's where color theory comes in. So, or color harmonies. There's a few rhythms that arrived over, you know, centuries of human psychology when we look at stuff or it just was created this way. Um, we are used to certain color combinations and over time, graphic designers and painters, they figure out a few, um, I would call reoccurring patterns. For me, honestly, this is super boring and I don't use it almost whatsoever, but you need to know this so you can forget it, okay? So I am telling you this so you can then forget it, but it's important. Another thing that you need to forget is this. Everybody probably Googled color and light, you know, motions and what's, what's this guy's name? Plutchik's wheel of emotion. I'm looking at this and I'm a color guy and my color script artist and I work with color every day and that's all I think about 24 seven. And this makes absolutely no sense. I have no idea why fear is in the green and terror. Uh, I know that somebody said, told me that this is a color grading wheel that uh, color graders use in the movie scenes and those are the patterns that they figured out. But I'm gonna tell you this, color is subjective for the most part. And when you see this, maybe anger and rage, I can agree with this in red, but the rest, I have no idea. So when you're looking at things like this, keep you know, look at it with a grain of salt. Why? I'm gonna explain a little bit later. All right, so let's get into the color harmonies. The first thing that you need to befriend is your color wheel. Why? Because on a color wheel, everything is already there. You have all the complementary colors opposite of each other. So if you look at your color wheel, you don't need to think. Green is complementary to red, uh, yellow to purple, um, orange colors are complementary to blue cools, right? And that's it. Technically you have one. The main one I say is blue versus orange because it represents warm colors and blue colors. You cannot get colder than cold blue and you cannot get warmer than orange, right? Then you have greens and reds, the second one. Then you have purple and yellow and then everything in between. But again, I would not think of color as the simple, right? Because there's more combinations of complementary schemes. But the main ones are this. If you look at any movie right now, all you're gonna see is blue and orange for the most part. That was, you know, that was, that was the color grading for the last 10 years probably in cinema, right? Why? Well, because for the most part, uh, human skin tones are usually warm on the warm side and then the blue environment is really good to pop them uh, on top of those, right? And the rest is usually not as commonly used in cinema. Okay, so now you're gonna say, Misha, what are those all, all ones and twos? Is this a math class? Well, I was trying to figure out the most easy way to remember uh, color schemes. So this is called complementary, so I call it one plus one. There's two colors and you're gonna have a complementary color scheme. So for example, here's an example here. You have 
a blue dude in an orange environment. It could be, you know, a blue avatar on a sunset sky, for example. Or it could be an orange avatar in the water, for example. I don't know, right? But that's why I call it one plus one, because it's one color plus one in color. It's called complementary color scheme. Complementary. And that's the first one. That's the most commonly used one. If you see any, you know, let's say if you have a green field and in, in the middle of the green field, you'll see, you know, a red dress girl in her Panama with flowers or something. That's called complementary color scheme. Of course, you need sometimes an extra color because not everything is so simple. So that's where we get to one plus two. You have one main color plus two. So you have a red and then you have two complementary to this color colors. One is a warm plus cool combination, right? Another one is red plus green combination. So, and that's why it's called complementary or split color scheme. I call it one plus two because one color combines two complementary to itself colors. That's why it's called one plus two. So this is called split. Um, another one, it's called analogous. I think that's the word. <laughs> I honestly, there's another thing that's called monochromatic. What's the difference between monochromatic? It's one plus one plus one because the only thing that is changing in the uh, hue uh, of this blue is value. It just goes up or down. And what happens with when an analogous, let's say you're gonna have pretty similar red and pretty similar dark purple red and then pretty similar orange that looks like red. So that's why it's called 1.1 plus 1.2 plus 1.3. Honestly, when you're painting, what you can do is you can technically take, uh, you can make everything black and white, put an overlay layer on top of everything, and then you're gonna have a monochromatic scheme. And then what you can do on top, you can add some variation of that color to make it analogous. Uh, for me, honestly, monochromatic and analogous is the same thing. So I won't even separate it. Yes, there's a little bit of a difference, but for the most part, not really. There's a triadic one. I call it two plus one. What does it mean, two plus one? Well, usually for me, I have two color combinations that are similar in terms of they are either warm or cool, or they are similar in a shade, and then they have another color as, as, as a contrast color. Where is this used? Honestly, I couldn't come up with an example out of my head. So, but you know, if you encounter it, you can call it triadic. I gotta be honest with you guys, when I'm looking at paintings and when I'm planning my paintings, I'm not like, ooh, this is gonna be analogous or this is gonna be triadic or tetradic. I never think about it uh, and I'll explain why. But you, again, I'm telling you this so you can forget it, but you can, you can be like, yes, I knew it a long time ago, but you know, damned it useless and some people, you know, maybe some people are going to use this, but again, I am telling you this so you can forget it and then learn a better way, but you still need to know it. So then you can forget it. Okay. Then tetradic, uh, I call it double complementary. It's when you have two colors, you can call it, uh, I don't know. I call it double complementary. I couldn't come up with an analogy two plus one and stuff like that. So it's called double complementary. Usually you have two colors could be similar in color range in terms of worms. And then they are paired with their uh, complementary schemes. So for example, here on the right, I'll show you all the examples that I did. And then you have square. Square, it's usually when you have, for me, for me, how I understand, you have, let's say, a warm color here and has a pretty close to it uh, color in terms of temperature and then you use it as a bridge to go to uh, a more cool version of this yellow for example because uh, and also at the same time this green 
has a complementary on the opposite side and then we go from green to this blue and then this blue is also complementary to uh, this warm and this orange or yellow honestly square thingamajig there's a lot of colors it's hard to balance them out the the best um, example that I could give you here is this this is the square <laughs> color scheme right um, so we have green glass and green glass green grass blue sky uh, kind of orange reddish tree with red highlights and then yellow highlights so now we have complementary colors red to green <sighs> and then we have yellow that is complementary to blue but again this is forget about it you understood it once now forget about it the things that i do want you to remember probably the most useful schemes out of all of this is probably i would say complementary color scheme is when you have the opposites and then i would say one plus two when you have one um, let's say this is a girl in the jungle and the blue sky is showing through and there's some green highlights and then she is all red as a highlight color, right? And you'll get, you'll understand my process a little bit clearer later on, right? Why? Because my process is usually this. I have colors as my background talking to each other. They're usually in a neutral base and then usually I track the eye with saturation. Uh, all of this you know, it's maybe it's really good for graphic design. We're gonna go more in depth into it. Right now, I'm just trying to skim through as fast as possible. Um, yeah, so for example, you know, the complementary one. Here is a, um, a split one, one plus two, right? We have greens complementing the red, we have the blues complementing the red, right? Uh, and that's it. Right, so I really like one plus two complement, uh, split complementary scheme because it's all about the focal point and everything else is there to support it. And then we have analogous or I guess monochromatic. This one is, well, I have the high ground. You underestimate my power, you know? So the lava, you know, or, or you know the scene that I'm referring to from the Star Wars, it's all, it's all pretty close to each other, colors with different hue shifts here and there towards yellows or towards orange or towards reds. But for the most part, it's all the same color for me, honestly. Uh, pretty simple, right? Everything that you're gonna paint in this scheme is probably with value and a few saturation differences here and there. We already talked about this. And this one is uh, tetradic, double complementary, right? So you have, um, let's say, red and yellow and red is complementary to the green and then the blue is complementary to the yellow uh, so that's why it's called double complementary um, another thing that you have to understand when we're we're talking about um, color combinations now we're talking about just pure color but another thing that we need to keep in mind that the color can be saturated or desaturated right and that's another difference that can attract the eye. So right now we're trying to attract the eye just by a main color popping on top of another color. That's it. There's I changed the value of the background here a little bit, but for the most part, what, all we're talking right now is about how combinations of color look good next to each other on a color wheel and how we can use that. But another thing is that you have to understand that why I think all this is bogus and just not useful is because I can technically have the whole color wheel right now, uh, you know, put next to each other and all the colors will start doing what? And this is really important concept for you to understand, guys. I know this looks ugly, but bear with me. When you're having this, if you have a chaos of, of a color scheme, and colors are yelling at each other, of course you can simplify it and then make it into, let's say, a complementary color scheme, right? And it's gonna work. But the thing is, what we can do is we can merge all those colors by just getting the saturation away from them. And then they can start talking, 
basically. So for example, here, what I did, I took the contrast away and I desaturated them a little bit. And let's make everything on a black background uh, like this, right? So look at this right here, right? Um, and look at this. Our role as artists is understand how colors talk to each other, okay? And a lot of the times, right, when we have, let's say, too much saturation and let's say opposite colors to each other, what we can do is we can bring them to a neutral zone or I call it, you know, <laughs> the peacekeeping zone by taking away the saturation. If you look at my color wheel, you know, and let me just do a screenshot for all of you guys so we can have it all together here. So where's my color wheel right here. So uh, I say uh, a neutral, <laughs> a neutral zone for all the colors where they don't fight is some somewhere right here. Not too dark, not too light, not too saturated, not too desaturated, a neutral ground. That's where all the colors speak, right? So a lot of the times when we're thinking about our color palette and we're like, well, what, what kind of a complementary scheme am I gonna use? Any color can be used with any color and it's gonna be fine, all right? As long as they talk to each other. So again, for you to bring colors together so they can talk, the only thing that you have to do is to saturate them, bring them to the same zone, right? So they can start speaking, right? Or, you know, sometimes you can make it them brighter but also they can, you can keep the saturation and they can also speak, right? Or to each other, or you can have same thing, but in the darkness, as long as the saturation and value are together, colors are speaking. Doesn't matter if they're complementary, not complementary. If you have a good grasp of values, all of your colors are gonna sing and speak to each other. Well, not sure about sing, but they're gonna speak to each other. To sing, that's why you need complementary color schemes. And I say this three things. Whatever is more complicated, like it's stupid that they put a name on all of this because you can, I don't think you can simplify all of the color schemes that you can get with just all of those things, right? So every, every time it's, it's something different. So that's why I usually have this three. Um, for the main thing and whatever as my I guess as my neutral base and then whatever is coming after that I just figure out as I go so yeah your main task as an artist is to make colors sing next to each other that's called color harmony uh, and then using hue saturation and value sliders to make certain tones hues and, and value decisions to make your story sing. And now we're talking about, we're gonna talk, we, we're gonna talk about uh, emotion that is associated with each color. Uh, bear with me, all of this is gonna make sense when we're gonna talk about example. I hate talking about pure naked uh, theory. Why? Because it's pretty useless. You look at this, you're like, Misha, what are you talking about? <laughs> right, so let's dive in to examples as soon as possible. But before we look at awesome artworks and movies, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about emotion, okay? So I'm gonna tell you this, guys. Remember when I told you that this thing that I found on the internet makes no sense to me? Well, because each and one of you over the lifetime accumulated certain associations with certain colors, yes? So, when you're thinking about colors and when you're thinking about what kind of emotions they bring to you, for the most part, they are personal to you. But there's a few associations that, um, what you might call it, accumulated over years of humans looking at stuff and talking about stuff and telling stories. And let's go color by color. When you're thinking about purely, let's say, orange color, what do you think about? What does this represent to you? Right now, look at this and say, what, sun, maybe fire, 
what else? Um, sunset, right? An orange room, kids room, maybe, right? So when you're thinking about color in this natural way as a human, you already understand what this color means to you. And you already understand what this color is gonna uh, tell your audience. So when you're making color choices, you know, think about what you're feeling when you are looking at this pure naked color, make an association to yourself, right here, little things that I pointed out is, you know, happiness, yellow flowers, happy child, sunset, or sunrise, you know, fire, um, desert sand, you know, sky, a um, little bit of gold, you know, swelling going to yellows. So maybe gold, what what other associations that can be like Mayans or something like that, but you get the gist, right? Um, what you're doing is you're being human, you're looking at a color. And since you are a human and lived in the real world for a long time, you naturally gonna have an association with this color and you cannot be wrong. Unless you're a lizard alien, of course. But again, I apologize to all the lizard aliens listening. This is a human color theory. For you guys, you need a special, <laughs> you need a special teacher who knows your psychology, right? But because I'm a human and you are a humans, right? We have naturally occurring associations with each color and you cannot be wrong because if you have an emotional response to it, you should use this color in your storytelling. For example, if we use the color orange, it's associated with happiness, but it's also associated with this, this or that. And then you can use this color in your scene or little sprinkles of it here and there to convey this emotion, right? For example, the, the color yellow. For some people, it's, you know, again, gold, money. For some people, sunflowers. It could be something very cheerful and very happy. For some people, it could be a representation of insanity, for example. I know a lot of uh, people who are uh, in stories when they um, treat, you know, when I talk about mental illness, they use the color toxic yellow to show, uh, you know, a psychological disease. So again, the color for the most part associated with something again, beautiful, but at, at the same time in the right context, for example, if you have, let's say a yellow hazmat suit, right? Or for example, if you didn't notice in the, in the movie Breaking Bad, Gus, he wore a yellow jacket that is, because meth, meth, meth is yellow, and then the guy is yellow, and then there, it was a very toxic relationship, he wore a yellow uniform, and his entire restaurant wore a yellow uniform. And are you gonna say, hey, this is just a coincidence? No, I watched the documentary. They actually had meetings about the movie to make color schemes for each the character, and how they were evolving. Let's say if the character was nice, and awesome, they were it's, they wore a orange sweater. And as they progressively became more depressed, then they became yellow and then maybe green and then blue, for example, right? So what I'm saying is human associative thinking is so powerful. And if you are human and can relate to all of us, you know, you, you know what each color means because when you look at it, you can analyze your own, what do I feel when I look at this color and then connect it and paint it out and then another human, when he looks at your painting, he can either relate or not relate. And then again, if you're a psychopath, I am sorry, it will be really hard for you to understand human emotions. All right, now to the color green. What does the color green associated with in our brains? Well, for me personally, is a sense of calmness. Oh, you go to the forest and you like, mm, this is nice. A little bit of freshness, you know, that's why, for example, in marketing, they use the orange and green combination to get, first of all, orange makes people hungry for some reason. I have no idea why, just makes. And then the green, and green is usually used in combination with orange or combination with blue. Why? Because usually if you have green package, look, that means it's organic, right? It makes it natural, comes from, from the earth, right? So when I, when I think about uh, the color green, calmness, trees, jungles, maybe like a few frogs, toxic frogs, maybe toxic fog also can be right. See color emotion and color perception and what people associated with is subjective. 
because it could anything goes and there's a lot of context needs to be involved. So first of all, what's the facial expression, let's say, of your character? What's the composition? And then the colors can emphasize that. Purely colors can sometimes just say this or that, but for the most part, context and where the color is used is really, really important. Let's say color cyan or blue. What do we associate with it, right? Ice, freshness, you know, Atlantis, maybe because it's an ocean, ocean, fish, sadness, right? Why are you so blue? Um, you know, for, for me, it's a blue frog, for example, something alien like, because especially super saturated, when it's super saturated, uh, people look at it as sometimes dangerous. That's why, for example, frogs have sometimes very saturated pigments on them to basically warn the uh, the predators that, hey, I am toxic or I look toxic, right? So again, associations with blue, fish, sky, freshness. So for example, when I'm thinking about a feeling of my painting, I can just think about my associations and then pick the right hues for my associations, right? For example, let's go on a mental journey. I want a, a fresh, you know, fresh looking, warm jungle. What are I gonna do? Well, I can technically, you know, I can paint an oasis and then in oasis, there's gonna be like red desert that is gonna be kind of hot, right? Then I'm gonna have nice calming greens on the tree and then I'm gonna have super blue color. Now what are I gonna have? Well, I have super hot, again, desert um, yellow sand and super refreshing water. And now people are like, well, it's hot. Why? Because color yellow associated with hot uh, and warmth, right? And fire, for example, and desert. And then I have nice blue cyan refreshing uh, river. And let's say if I have a character diving into that river and having been refreshed, you know, the audience can be like, oh, they can be, they can communicate with, with that painting on an emotional level through color, right? And then we have purple. Purple is very special color. Cyan, purple, why? Because purple is, can you say, is it, is it, is it, is it a cold color? Is it a warm color? I gotta say this, purples can be both. Purples is a bridge that you can walk on between two families, the warm families and the blue families. It's a bridge that can connect. When in doubt and you have no idea what half tones you want to use, uh, and I'll show later examples, use purple, especially in your shadows. Because if you cannot find the right color combination, you cannot just, you cannot go wrong with purple because purple is so close to the warm family and so close to the blue family. So if you have it as a half tone or a shadow, it's not gonna look off when next to a warm color or a blue color, right? And then purple overall is associated, associated with royalty. Well, why? I never, I have no idea. But the theory is that purple is really hard to acquire in real world. It's super rare and usually only the rich have access to it because the dye was so rare and so hard to acquire. So only the royalty had the purple hues and some, I don't know, special birds that were also very rare on certain continents. And then the kings and queens couldn't get to it. So when uh, over time, purples started associating with royalty and sometimes mystery. And again, Purple, different shades of it can be used as a mystery color. Why is so close to cold color? And again, for example, the color blue, because it's associated with, you know, deep waters. And then we're always afraid of the deep because we have no idea what's going on in there. So that's why color blue is either sadness or mystery. And then you can have the same shade of blue coin towards purples and it's gonna be the same effect of mystery again, or royalty. But then if you pair those colors and say, see here, it's an interesting combination. Remember when I talked about purples and then we talked about the yellows as complementary colors. Here, uh, it's a more appealing shade of yellow and more appealing shade of purple, not so saturated, right? Because in my example, that's how usually people show examples. It's something like this and this, this is the example. But again, here it looks like this, and like this, same thing, 
But here the colors are yelling at each other, but they look nice to each other. And here they're not only nice to each other in terms of their talking, but they sing together because they talk, because they are pretty similar in, to, in terms of saturation and not so similar in terms of value, but also they sing together because they're complementary to each other. And then for me, usually with purples, you know, I get sunset vibes and pinks. Another thing that people found out that when we're going a little bit forward towards pinks now, pinks has a calming effect on people for some reason. I have a theory why. Because people say that the color pink is a color of nurturing and calmness. And my theory, it might be stupid, but when we're children and we are uh, being fed by our mama, what do we see the most? It's a pink nipple, right? <laughs> we see a pink nipple all, <laughs> all through the childhood. So I think that in our brains, when we're looking at the color pink, right? When we're looking at the color pink, it's calming to us because we saw it through the entire childhood. I might be wrong, but that's what people, um, that's what people say that the pink has a calming effect. Another experiment that they did actually was quite interesting. They painted uh, a pretty high security uh, jail and all the jail cells became pink. And then they measured the previous year uh, mortality rate and aggressiveness rate and then the next year's rate. And then when they all were in the pink cell, um, you know, the aggression of the people went down. Why? I have no idea. Maybe because it would remind them if you know what. You know, another thing that pink is associated with is, you know, maybe flowers, romance. And then pink is kind of going towards uh, reds and, um, why the pink is also associated with passion and, and romance? Well, it's because when we are, you know, rumpa dumping and, um, you know, having a great time with our loved one, uh, we have a lot of blood flow. We become more pink. Uh, there's more pink pigment under my, our skin and everything else. I know it's very uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get through it as, as fast as possible. But you have to understand the psychology of a human brain when we think about colors and make this association in your own brain, why does it make you feel a certain way, right? And then we get to the red, to the, to the red colors. And then the red colors are usually associated with danger because of blood, because of, you know, again, rage, our, our, uh, our, our cheeks, when we are very, very angry, go all the way to our, to our face and we become red. Uh, a lot of dangerous, poisonous, you know, animals have uh, red skin tones and they're poisonous. And again, uh, red is a color of rage and passion for the same reason, because, you know, our faces and, and, and our bodies get more blood in certain places. And that's why it's associated with passion, right? Again, it's all, it's all in the psychology. Sorry for a super uncomfortable uh, talk, but I am over. But you have to understand all of those things, right? To understand how to manipulate the human psychology when you paint, right? Um, okay, so let's now go a little bit further with our explorations. Now you know what every color technically represents and of course we can talk about each color for a really really long time and we can find endless associations with it right but the main thing that you have you have to understand is first you know think about the color combinations right but think about color combinations after you think about your main emotion so for us to tell a story, what we have to do, uh, what I have to do is first make a connection to a color in my brain to a story that I'm trying to paint. So for example, if I wanna make, um, you know, if I want to make a very calm scene and it's pretty close, let's say, to an ocean side because my environment is an ocean. I immediately, what can I say? Hmm, greens, blues, and cyan. So I already know just by thinking about the emotion that I want to 
uh, to accomplish in my painting, I already think about this spectrum, right? And then I can be like, okay, what is gonna look good on top of this? Let's say this color palette right here that invokes, you know, calmness and greenness and freshness. Now let's say it's a character that needs to feel calm in the calm, let's say, environment, but needs to bring excitement. And then I'm like, okay, what brings excitement? What color brings excitement to blues? I'd be like, hmm, red, maybe, as a highlight color, right? And I can do like a blue ocean side, and then there's gonna be, let's say, a girl in a red dress, and maybe she killed someone. Calm, interesting scene, you know, with a twist. Because people are like, well, this is all nice and cool. And then there's this red girl who's like, who's a highlight. And like, maybe she is, she wants to be calm, but she's a very exciting person in terms of red. Or what you can do is you can have her wear maybe a blue dress and she's be even more calmer. For example, in somewhere in the shadows in the foreground, you can have some reds to show that she's such a twisted person that in the foreground, she left a bloody 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 spot of a, of a of a murder scene so you can technically what you can do is you can use the sense of calmness add an interesting highlight in there in terms of like this person is exciting or you can use the same colors and then with a red that you're gonna you're gonna basically hide an interesting plot twist in your scene i know this is all theoretical so but we are getting closer to examples but all those things that I'm talking about, you need to think about. So instead of thinking about only, you know, what is complementary, and then let's say you did think about your story and what kind of color you're gonna use there to evoke the emotion, theoretically, now we're getting to a new rule. And this rule is called 60, 30, 10. And I use this rule all of the time. Do you know what this rule means? I'm not sure if you do, but here's what this rule means. Let's look at a few. Um, let's look at a few examples. So movies again are the best teacher in all of this. So when we're thinking about color schemes and we're looking at this picture, let's first of all dissect what is 60, what is 30, what is 10. So 60 is a dominant color in your scene, you know, for this scene is probably going to be this, you know, so this is going to be for 60%, we see all this shade of, it's kind of like greenish, greenish yellow, right? And then we have for 30%, we have kind of like browns, right? Let's say, and then for the highlight, which is 10%, we'll have the greens, right? And this is our color palette. As you can see, it's pretty logical because we need to create a neutral base for our scene, for our character or focal point to pop. So that's why we have 60% of one color and then we have another of a variation color just to keep the scene interesting and not so boring so it's not monochrome. And then we pick a color that is contrast it to all of those and that's going to be our 10 percent highlight or contrast color let's look at this painting this one already has the colors picked for us it's the same thing right so we have for 60 percent let's let's look what we have for 60 percent i think for 60 percent we have all the reds right for 30 percent we have all the yellows right and for 10 percent we have here it's not a highlight. It's not a highlight color. It's just, I would say, a, uh, what do you call it? A variety color. So the 10%, it can be an interesting variety color or it can be a highlight color like in here when she's green, right? But 60, 30, 10% rule is really good because when you think about it, your scene is not gonna be overpopulated with color first. And secondly, it's not gonna be out of control, right? Because a lot of people want to add all the color in the world. And I'm gonna tell you this, guys. The key to good color harmonies is limited color palette. Look at this movie. I think it's the taxi driver, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. Uh, but for example, here, what do we have as our as our, as our primarily 60% rule? It's probably gonna like those browns, right? There's a lot of those. 
And then we have yellow for 30%, this yellow, you know, and then we have a red shirt as 10% of a highlight, you know, same thing, 60, 30, 10. Let's look at this thing, right? We have a lot of browns or oranges, and then we have browns for 30%, right? Because we have a lot of yellows. And then we have a white highlight, contrast color, 10%, right? It, there, there could be a little bit more, like slightly more, but you get the gist of it, right? Again, neutral base, some another color to make it not so boring for variety and a contrast color for our main character. Let's see if we can spot any color harmonies here. We have yellow, we have, let's say this is, let's say this is the yellow. Uh, I'll say this is more on the orange side, honestly, to me, All right? And then we have brown, so it's pretty analogous, right? Um, and then we have the color white for the, for the, like, what is this? I don't know. Do I care? Am I going to think about all of this stuff that we talked about here? No, I'm not going to be thinking about it. All I'm going to be thinking about is this, and this is really important. All I'd be thinking is, are my colors speaking to each other? Okay, this brown and this yellow or orange are speaking to each other. They're not screaming, they're not bringing any attention. They're in the background. And another question is, is my focal point clear? First of all, value, right? The white is really, really contrasty. And then his color of his pink is the only color that exists with this kind of hue, plus minus, right? So I'm like, okay, I have contrast. I have uh, colors speaking to each other and I have a highlight. That's all I need. Is it a triad? Is it not a triad? Doesn't matter. Honestly, doesn't matter. Don't overcomplicate things. Okay, let's look at this, for example. What is this? Okay, this is interesting because this one has a little bit of complementary colors in it. We have a primarily blue scene for 60% of it. Then for 30%, we have greens. See, greens here and then the shades of greens in the shadows, right? So greens, and then we have a highlight color, which is the red. And this we can technically call it exactly one plus one no, uh, no, one plus two. Remember, when we have a red is opposite of blue, and then green is complementary to red. So this is one plus two. Again, see, this one is used a lot in movies, and it's used a lot in paintings, and it's a very useful formula, right? One plus two. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple image, and it looks awesome. And again, another thing that you have to understand is contrast, right? Uh, remember when we talk about lighting in general, uh, lighting here is what? Light against dark. So when you think about your values first, just like in a lecture previously, and then to your values, you add the color harmonies, then you get a nice image. Here, uh, the story itself is interesting because let's say blue, is associated with could be calmness or ocean and then it's an old movie i think it's called space odyssey if i'm not mistaken and the association here is like well they're somewhere in space almost like underwater or in a submarine but danger is coming there's some red in the distance hinting that something is going to happen later on right see and sometimes it's really hard to tell a story only through one image and that's why sometimes you need a sequence of images like color scripting or storyboarding. I'm going to tell you this, guys. Keep your images simple. You cannot tell a whole, you know, book of events just through one image. Usually, when you try to say too many things with one image, you need to have a sequence of images versus just one image. So here it's really, again, three colors. I would say it's... For me, it's two colors, blue and red, and that's it, you know. And let's look at the modern movies. Let's say, um, you know, Wonder Woman. It's the same color grading. It's We have a warm color of her skin and a little bit of red here, contrasting on the bluish green. So I would say this is a what color scheme? It's a one plus one. We have a complementary color 
mixing with with the blue it's a warm color with a blue color that's it and again for 60 percent we have blues and greens for 30 percent uh, we have some reds here and then for 10 percent for a highlight we have her skin tone everything is super simple again don't overcomplicate things okay let's look at the tarantino classic right same thing we have uh, some reds we have some greens here and then we have a highlight color for her skin which is this purplish purplish not purplish but orangish red or something like that right same thing like let's look at this this is super clear right we have uh, the highlight color which is 10 percent of the entire scene right or you know what it's probably more because the buildings in the back are brownish not brownish but kind of like matte white orange right a very pastel like and then we have for 30 percent we have oranges here right and then we have for 10 percent we'll have the sky right but as a highlight color we're using this we're using value to highlight towards our guy right and again just looking from this color scheme what you what what are you feeling always ask this question when you're thinking when you when you're thinking about emotion and color and you're looking at a movie or an illustration always think what you're feeling right for example here why i like this scene from tarantino movie so much is because the color palette itself you know and uh, lose this there's it's not the color palette of, of the scene because this scene is amazing why because the colors themselves are pretty you know they're pretty calming, to be honest. I would, I would have a cigarette with this guy. There's milk, you know. There's browns. There's, uh, there's a few oranges here. For sixty percent of this entire scene, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have browns. For thirty percent, we probably have, let's say, this green. Let's say or green blue, for example, right? And as a highlight color, we have this. I say right because the thing is the the whole action is taking place here and I think he just stood up from this chair so that's where the eye has to be again in in, in movies not every image is pitch perfect in terms of uh, composition and color scheme that's only the benefit of illustration visual development artists because we can technically picture a perfect moment right but here it's interesting and that's when you kind of need to break the rules because let's say well this has to be a threatening scene for people who didn't watch the movie there's there's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of uh, Jewish people uh, hiding under the floor of this scene and this guy knows it and this guy doesn't know where the Jews are right so this guy is trying to have a nice conversation with this guy and he's all friendly and nice but with his niceness and friendliness uh he slowly starts to threaten him until he gives up the jews over here and that's the interesting contrast because this character himself looks and speaks so unthreatening in such an unthreatening environment that should be nice and calm and awesome but then when the camera pans down under the uh, the floor and we see Jews trying not to make a sound and we know that this guy just invited a bunch of machine gun people in there, there's a dissonance in our brain that, man, this is a, such a nice and warm almost moment type of a deal. And I think that this guy is going to get away with the lie and we're all calm because, again, the color grading is always intentional. But now this colors and this guy's behavior makes no sense so that's why you don't have to always show through colors what's going to happen in a scene you can fake out a scene with nice and cheerful colors and then make something gruesome happen in terms of actual emotion in your scene like for example if we're gonna you know if we're gonna have a nice brightful cheerful you know field with flowers and there's a little girl going in the distance and in the foreground we have like an arm laying around all bloody again in the shadow there's going to be a dissonance there's a little girl in the bright in the cheerful colors on the field and nothing is threatening but then when you really look at this you're like oh my god she's actually like a very scary person see what i mean color doesn't always have to say what's going to happen in the scene it can subvert expectations and do something else. All right. Uh, here's some more colors. For example, 
Remember we talked about saturation and let's talk about reds first. See, same rule, 60, 30, 10% rule. This guy is the highlight. We have the reds. See, we have a few greens. Why? Well, greens are complementary to the reds, so why not? I think the walls themselves, they're like dark green. But as we can see here, for the 60%, we have browns. Then for 30%, we have reds. Why? Well, I think if not, I'm not mistaken, I'm sure who this guy, maybe this Churchill, uh, maybe not. But he's speaking to this guy and we are looking at those red curtains. So maybe danger is arriving soon. Maybe it's not spoken about. Maybe it's spoken, you know, in a dialogue uh, between the lines, for example. But again, the viewer, when she's looking at color keys, color frame, keyframes, or sequence of visual development images, we can hint at certain emotions by adding a certain colors in it, right? And again, this painting works, why? Because we have neutral base, colors talk to each other, and then we have a highlight color, a contrast color for the, uh, for the main focal point. Let's look at uh, another image, right? We have, you know, a red guy with with, with with a white highlight. This is basically monochrome, right? With with a with a white highlight color. And he speaks to the drone and everything turns red because I think the drone in Space Odyssey goes, or the AI goes uh, against the spaceman, right? And then in the scene, we feel unease because there's so much red because red is associated with what? Well, with sirens, with blood, with anger. And then this, this, this scene is uncomfortable to look at for a long time. Right. And that's why color is so important when we look at any image, because it's subconsciously telling us what to feel, even from far away, before we actually see what kind of gesture, emotion or composition we have prepared for our viewer. Right. So, for example, here. Uh, well, this is pretty obvious that this is a bad chick. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But this red really really accents on top of this those browns and we're like well just looking at this image without context we can be like well she's probably very dangerous or she's maybe she means she's very flirty or maybe she's on a dangerous mission because this red and this red again see this is the only reds in the scene to highlight everything and i'm going to show you a little trick to you know simplify other people's work and simplify and look at your own work uh, under a different angle. So for example, when you're thinking about your composition in terms of color, what you can do is you can color pick or analyze in other people's work and then think about it in this ways. There's a square here and there's a square here and there's a square here. That's it. This is the entire color scheme of this image. Just, you know, put everything as simple squares and you and look at your own min image if it works or not, right? What do you think? Are your images working when you're gonna put it through this? Or your image is gonna look something like, you know, something all over the place that doesn't have a clear focal point and you will you don't understand values and everything, you know, it just falls apart. Where do you look here? Do you look here? Do you look here? Right? So those little simple I'll call it color diagrams or, or I guess color color swatches or yeah color maps I guess uh, it really helps out first dissect other people's work and then look at your own work and see if it works just by color picking different hues and making them as squares and see if the relationship between them works or not and what needs to be changed and actually without committing any brushstrokes you can solve a lot of problems just on the side of your canvas on a little square like this by just thinking about the relationship of those awesome color color squares and see if they work like for example if i wanted to add more of a of a punch here maybe i can add her like a on a, on a, on a green carpet for example but the carpet is now too distracting, right? Maybe I need to, you know, balance it out with other greens here, maybe another green here. But now the highlight color, you know, disappears. So maybe what I need to do is I need to add another more saturated highlight color. Now she pops back in, right? So now what you can do is you can solve a lot of problems really, really fast just by doing this. Let's look at another example. So Stark. Mr. Stark, right? So for example, here, what do we have as highlight color? Red, right? That's the highlight color. And then everything else is a neutral base that the red pops on top of, right? 
what kind of uh, harmony this is. Is it a triangle or not triangle? Triangle bangle? I don't know. I don't care. You know why? Because I can only think about does this color pop on top of it in terms of contrast, value, and everything else. And if it does, cool. If it doesn't, oh well. Right? And another thing that is interesting usually more desaturated objects and more clean whites and grays is usually associated with, you know, sci fi colors and sci fi settings because they're so muted. Again, because of our associations. What do we think about, you know? Uh, here, no, those are the. What do we think about? Um, you know, what do we think about when we think about sci-fi, right? It's it's usually really clean metal. Metal associated with gray, uh, with a clean lab, with with doctor coats. So when we're using desaturated colors, and like blue desaturated colors and everything else. It's usually associated with a sci-fi. Somewhere here, I have yeah, I had a lot of like for example, look at this color palette, right? Uh, look at this. It's, it's very futuristic, very limited also. Uh, and as you can see here, they use the purple as the highlight for the lady. And that's the you remember when I talked about saturated, desaturated. Everything is just saturated here. So now on contrast of saturation, we're gonna look at this person what the color means of the purple maybe she's um ambiguous maybe she's mysterious right maybe she could be dangerous so sometimes what you can do is you can use the neutral base to you know just show that nothing is going on everything is boring and then you can have you know a very bright and cheerful color on top of that just just look at this square and all this grayness what does this square tells me this square tells me I will not give up. I'll do everything fine. And you know, if we're going to add more squares to the right, and they're going to be all just saturated, we're still going to look at the square in the middle. Well, first of all, because it has the more yellow, but technically, this could be, you know, symbolism for, you know, in the saturated gray world, a spark of light and happiness still exists. And I can use this just by looking at those squares, nothing is painted yet. You know, I can think about what my painting is going to look like just by, or feel like just by, and then from looking at this and then I can come up with a composition, right? Uh, boom, 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 boom. Same thing here, for example, same limited color palette here. We have a little bit of an accent, you know, the orange sparks over here. Dun, dun, dun. Same here, uh, very limited. Oh, uh, understandable. Okay, so now what have we learned, right? When you were thinking about our compositions, have a neutral base that is 60%, and at 60%, add another 30% of something. And on top of that, add a highlight for 10%. And now we have a CT that is glowing, right? That says that is the basic 60-30% rule, right? And when we're thinking about uh, complementary colors, right? Do think about them, but do not be limited by is this this or that. Because if your values are correct, it doesn't matter if you know if your colors are super complementary or not. As long as the color doesn't distract, as long as the color doesn't bring attention where you don't want the attention to be, you're fine. So values are something that always bring the painting together and as long as your colors speak to each other you're fine now let's talk a little bit more about color and storytelling right we're going to talk about movies a little bit more right and um i'm gonna have the blade runner as the example so everyone knows blade runner really long movie <laughs> i wouldn't say it's boring it's pretty good cinematography but um it is a pretty long movie, but we all know this guy. This guy is a uh, spoiler alert. He's like a human Android guy and he is on a mission. He is on a mission to recover. I think a road, a rogue robot in there. And the whole movie is basically like a mystery thriller slash detective story. And the cinematographer or the director in this movie used symbology or the colors 
He used in specifically a few shades of yellow to represent something. And this yellow represented truth for him. So our main character lives in a pretty green, green environment that doesn't look very super pleasing, right? And then on top of this green environment, we have a pretty, as you can see, desaturated yellow, but that's the only yellow that we can see in the whole scene, right? The cinematographer subconsciously try to make a connection between truth discovery and next steps to a color yellow and hues that relate to that. So for example, when he goes inside the house of this guy, what do we see? You know, a yellow light behind, shining. Did they have to make it yellow? No, it's all a conscious choice, right? As you can see here, he's getting, as you can see, as he's getting closer to the truth when he talks to this guy, yellow and yellow intensifies, right? And then when he kills the guy, he finds a what? A yellow flower. Do you think it's so, you know, it's a, it's a just a big coincidence? No, right? He looks at the yellow flower because, you know, something is spinning in his head now. The, the discovery is almost there, right? And then the next one is this one, right? When he goes to the library and he starts asking around, look how the entire scene is yellow, all right? So as he gets closer to the truth, this is really important for like color key artist, right? Because that's gonna be your job. It's gonna be your job to, um, um, your job to think about, right? And then in between things, like for example, you have a character here. Uh, I think, I don't remember what happened with her, but uh, she has a yellow jacket here and she speaks to him. So he gets even closer to the truth a little bit, right? And then what happens when he gets super close to the truth? Well, well, first of all, he gets even closer and even closer. And as you can see in almost every scene, they had a different light bulb or a local color of a object, right? To basically remind us that he's either closer or farther away from the truth. And then when he really came super close to the truth, everything just went monochrome because there's nothing but the truth <laughs> around our character, right? So when we're thinking about color sequentially, right so it's from point a to point b right uh we have the room to have a color progression for example towards the say oranges and then we can rise up the stakes right when we're talking about color scripting for example but most of you guys are either illustrators not a whole lot of you are color key artists right and let's look at some examples of actual work of painters uh, and see how they use color to their advantage, right? So for example, here, this is a super easy example, right? We know what light shines on this guy. It's probably the only one. It's the key light from here and it's red. Why is it red? It's a pretty threatening looking night, right? This is super boring. This is a monochrome slash slash analogous, uh, <laughs> I hate that word, uh, color scheme, right? And yeah, it's a pretty boring image color wise. It's, is it well executed? Yeah, render is really good, but color wise, well, um, you know, the only thing that I can tell you this here, guys, he has a really good understanding of saturation versus desaturation. So for example, here, he cannot make this side of his cool in terms of like blue. So I remember when we talked about uh, color yesterday, what did this person do to make this color colder? What he did, he took away saturation from this, right? To make a colder side on the other side, right? But color wise, threatening dude, smoke, fog, uh, usually under lighting like this, is usually used for something, you know, threatening. It's like, you know, when you put your uh, flashlight underne underneath your nose and then you have this, you're gonna go, ooh. And then, I have no idea why this is scary, but it's scary for human beings. Yeah. Same thing here, uh, Ryan Lang, 
uses the same trick in the book. You want to make something th threatening in red? Now do this. The only thing that I don't like about this painting that uh, well, the guy gets lost. The, the the face gets lost. Needs a little bit of a you know highlight here, um, and it's not there. So I don't know why Ryan Lang didn't paint that in. I didn't want to insult anybody, but you know. Um, and here we can see that he was also experimenting with mood. See, with the blue one, he wanted to, to go for like a more kind of like neutral. Maybe it's, a, I don't know, but this doesn't look as intense, right? Does it look scary? Maybe. Does it look intense? No, not really. This looks a little bit, I think this one is the best one. I really like this one because it's a very pretty um, color palette. But with the, with the bottom left and bottom right, yeah, I guess intensity, right? But, you know, it's pretty boring. It's, it's just red, red on red. Uh, <laughs> see, that's another thing. Remember when we talked about contrast? Red on red creates red and it doesn't pop. So that's why maybe he needed a little bit more something behind so this guy pops. But again, silhouette works, everything else works. Red colors, you know, anger, you know, epicness, frustration, all of that. Uh, but, you know, I really like this one. Again, color yellows are picked for a reason uh, in oranges. It's calm. It's fantastical. Uh, the color yellow is usually something exciting. Uh, the intensity of the light is there to highlight. And as you can see here, the same thing. 60% is a neutral, as you can see, neutral colors talking to each other. You know, and it's pretty the same. It's probably like browns greens and yellows here and then you have a highlight color for 10 percent or again for the value for 10 percent we probably have the greens for the whole color palette, right super simple um for example here a really good example of showing difference remember when you want to suck the life out of something you know and uh, make something more gloomy and sad decrease the saturation because everything that we think about dies and then if it dies you know people become gray because the blood stops flowing uh, flowers dry up and become gray and then when you get the color out of things they look dead so and here this is a really good example of you know saturation and desaturation this is a very not a very saturated yellow but, but everything else is super desaturated. So the night pops, you know, another thing you have to be really careful because sometimes you can overdo things. So for example, just imagine if this was like very yellow, right? It would, it would have been too much. It would have brought too much attention to it, right? So you have to be really careful with, uh, with your contrast, right? And then here, this one is really cool. I really like this one. Uh, this is very dramatic lighting. And remember when we talked about drama in, again, in previous lecture, it's when you have, remember you have your highlight color or value, and then you have a neutral base. And this is really far from this. And usually anything that is backlit, that has a really cool rim light, uh, looks awesome. Another thing that he did, he added a lot of bounce light underneath of all of those things. And this bounce light, uh just adds extra flair and you know puts the people or puts the mouses into the environment itself and of course guidelines etc 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 but we're talking about lighting yeah this is this is pretty epic lighting um very high key uh to the point as you can see uh the local colors of the mouse and everything else is just disappears right and here's a calm very very you know happy place type of a type of a deal painting and in this one again you know the lighting is pretty epic uh in terms of drama as you can see uh really really strong highlights and rim light but the color itself what, what, what is chosen as you can see for 60 percent it's green for 30 percent we have a little bit of browns and everything else and for 10 percent let's say we have the color of his skin for highlight and of course overall uh the you know the samurai itself is a very strong silhouette in terms of value right because values here are super strong i know that he um works a lot in black and white and then adds color sometimes um 
sometimes he works you know directly through color but a lot of times he does black and white layout sketches this one is interesting right because as we can see browns as you can see browns and grays and dark blues here they're all neutral base again um and everything here is convinced through a um through values and contrast but what do we feel when we look at this painting? Um, it looks like he's talking, doesn't look like they're really sad. It's a very calm scene, but as you can see, if we just look at the colors themselves, where they are pretty muted, and when you have muted colors, it's usually that means there's less things going on, right? And it's not, there's, there's not gonna be like a, you know, rainbow pony coming in and playing rock metal. Right, just just by looking at this color palette alone, what do we feel? Oh, right, we're like we're going to IKEA or something, or maybe eating chocolate. It's, it's there's no association with anything super exciting or super dramatic, right? And that's what the scene is, right? Um, and what do we need to to make of it is again, our color plan has to be from the beginning through associative thinking when we're thinking about, again, not this, but this, right? What each color represents, right? And over here, I didn't go too in depth in terms of like what association we have, let's say, for example, for desaturated greens, uh, because you have to do it on your own, in your own brain, right? Uh, where's the uh, examples? Okay, I think we're in this example. and. Yeah, so for example, this one is a really, really nice um, show of complementary colors, right? And also, storytelling-wise, remember when I did that thing with the yellow painting? Oh, I completely forgot about this example. But what uh, this artist is doing, he's showing a mundane life through a repetitive blue color, right? And again, blue, green, everything else is associated with what? With sadness, with we, with nothing happy, right? And then contrast of color is really important. Here, on top of the entirely blue scene with a few little saturated things here and there, what do we have? We have a pop and then we have a contrast pop of color, right? And this thing sings, right? Because now we can see that, you know, only this guy is enlightened because first of all, um, he's a monk and we can see that. And secondly, uh, we can see that he is not under the influence of whatever those guys are under. So we have contrast through hue, right? Orange against against blue, and you can do anything uh, like this. Let's say if you had, again, an orange environment and a blue guy in it, uh, but here he connected the you know the enlightenment with that he is still saturated he still has life in it and then everyone else lost their life lost their happiness or enlightenment through losing their colors right for example there is this really really interesting uh movie it's called corpse bride by tim burton and the i already mentioned it a couple of times but uh in that world everything that what was desaturated and, and towards blues was the real world and then the moment when they went into the underworld, where it was the, the, the world of the dead, everything was like super brightful, very cheerful. There was a lot of greens and reds and it was like a party, right? And then through color, what they did just, again, see if you take away saturation, you take away the pigment, you take away the life, that means you're making something sadder, you're making something weaker and more dead. But then when you add saturation, you are bringing life back into it until you have so much saturation that he may be like very toxic chaotic and again it's 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 your own decision how you make those associative thinkings uh work for your own painting for example this one is again super simple uh there's there's no story whatsoever in this thing it's backlit and sometimes you have those shots when you are just need to have a nice silhouette. So anything that is backlit produces really nice silhouettes and very long 
cool shadows. Um, uh, we can replace this with a cool shot of, uh, you know, if this was a cowboy, you know, standing, you know, preparing to shoot, for example, we could have had a really nice silhouette of this guy, right? Um, so backlighting is usually if you have something silhouette emphasized, so you can have two guys killing each other or fighting, for example, right? Back, but backlighting, especially sunset lighting with, with monochrome colors, is really good for that. As you can see here, we have the same color relationship, and there's not much story here. The only the only thing that is here is a feeling. You know, it's kind of fresh. It's weird. Uh, we have the contrast for the background. It's also backlit. It's nice for the silhouette. But there's not there's not much color story going in in this in terms of lighting or color, right? This is a little bit more interesting, right? It's uh, it's an it's an elf looking goblin, right? And then we have you know red um, red lighting underneath of it with a few rim light. This is actually a perfect example of our previous lecture, right? But the thing is here, again, you know, he's threatening red, pretty boring in terms of color and light, but it doesn't have to be overly complex. Why? Because, well, it's selling the, um, it's, it's, it's selling the persona. So why overcomplicate things, right? A lot of the times we need to present just, you know, an epic moment and yeah backlighting uh light from the left or from the right we have clearly defined um planes over here uh the only thing that i really like here is uh i really like half shadows when you have half shadows going over a character and not everything in the light it just creates extra depth because the human eye thinks that something is overlapping in terms of story here again there's not much going on uh, unless we look at contrast. Contrast, pretty, pretty, pretty standard. We have the main focal point, and then whatever is receding into the background, which is less contrast as this, is third, fourth, fifth, and into the distance uh, focal point. So that's pretty standard. Uh, let's look at this. This mm, this is a little bit more interesting. I think here the artist told a little bit more of a story through through lighting, uh, not so much through color, right? So for example, if we wanted to have an accent color, we again we could have added more, you know, maybe saturation here, right? Because the moment we would add more saturation. But the thing is, this whole thing is so desaturated, right? That either we'll have to add saturation to everything. So if everything is equally important, then we can just keep looking at the tiger. But I think the conscious decision here was this, right? Pretty, uh, I would say monochromatic, almost black and white color palette, right? Everything is pretty graphic. So those are the main two colors, right? But the lighting itself is staged very interesting, right? Because this guy is not, uh, I think this guy is fighting this guy. Right, you can't really see this guy at all unless you really squint. I didn't know that this tiger is so big, right? But the cool thing about this, well, first of all, the pose and the gesture and the silhouette, the shape itself that he is, he was going somewhere, now he turned around, but also that he's half in shadow. And half in shadow is awesome. This is a very complex value range in terms of it's a checkerboard one, right? But um, in terms of, again, I love seeing when people put something half in the shadow because it adds extra depth and also some mystery because this guy just went in there and he is he is you can you can you can feel how the sun you know warms up his nose and he, he's just going out and uh, i think that's why it's super cool when you know when, when when we use shadows remember when i talked about noir in the previous lecture that we need to control our shadows and we can place anything that we want in front of our light. And that's exactly the case. I, we see that on top of it, there's there's a giant uh, roof uh, rock looking thing. But is it super accurate? I have no idea. Do we need to care? No, not really. Oh, actually the lighting is coming from this uh, side, sorry. Um, yeah, let's look at some other things. Uh, this one is super cool. Um, again, we're just looking at color wise, it's so hard to find good paintings that really try to tell a story through the color and light. Um, usually you can see them only in color scripts. 
because there you have the range. But for example, here, we do get a story just by looking at this, right? Why? Well, first of all, about the neutral base. Everything is calm. Everything is down to the earth. Nothing is really going to happen right now. We don't, we don't feel terrified. We feel at ease, you know, and that's what this, this environment does to me at least. Right. So again, muted colors, there's still some highlights, right? This one, but value takes, um, the main role here. And I like those kind of muted, very low value range paintings, very controlled, really hard to accomplish something like this. But again, desaturated earthly colors. What's the association with this? Well, of course it looks like earth and looks like ground, but when we look just at this, right. And maybe a few here, right. We, we see the earth, we see the greens, we see the blues. And this reminds of us like very calm farm. And that's how you need to look at colors. Um, next one, I wanted to show you a little bit of a comic book uh, style that is very graphic. Here, the lighting itself doesn't serve that much of a purpose in terms of the main, again, the main purpose of lighting is to emphasize and point towards our focal points. And here, the lighting is not really interacting with this weird uh, thing. Uh, it's only interacting with this, this and that, because this is a more of a comic book style and you can lie a little bit here and there. But again, light is here just to direct, just to emphasize our focal point and color in here, it just shows that it's very calm, mysterious blue. Blue again is a mystery color, a little bit, not very saturated, very grounded uh, and not, not much excitement is happening right now. Um, it's all or high and mighty, it's, it's like they are the kings of this palace or the kings of this abbey or something like that. Um, same graphic approach, same 60, 30, 10% rule, 60% background, 30, well, a little bit more, maybe the dragon itself, and then 10% the highlight color of the girl, right? This one is super simple. I want to emphasize one interesting thing here. And it and it's that those wings are they don't have to be blue but why are they blue well because if let's say if we remove them if we remove those wings in terms of color right because color also attracts eye what do we see now we only pay attention to the girl right and that is bad so color here acts as a bridge from focal point to focal point. We jump to it, right? Let's, let's make a diagram of this. So this is the 60% of the sky. Oh crap, where are you? Here you are. This is the 60% of the sky. This is the dragon and this is the girl. What do we look like? Uh, look at only the girl, right? But what about if we have a little square of purple saturated color here and a little purple saturated uh, square here? What do we do? We look at this and then we also here and here and we have more flow through our entire painting. And that is achieved through what? Saturation or desaturation. Right. And here again, what is this? Is it a triangle? Is it a, what, what kind of a color harmony is this? I don't care. Right. We don't care. We need to only know about the principles of saturation versus desaturation, a few complementary colors, and then see where the ad go, where the, where the eye goes and doesn't go. All right. Next one. This one is also a little bit more on the graphic side and it's um, really driven by value. But here we can see the gold colors that remind us of what? Well, gold and maybe, maybe royalty. And then we have a bunch of blue looking things, right? Uh, but the main thing is for the feeling of this painting, what do you feel like? I feel, like I'm looking at a old tapestry almost like old, old painting that is going to be hung at the, at the castle. 
And how, how does this feeling is achieved through color? Well, again, same thing. We have golden royalty colors here, very saturated blues to have some variety and bring us across the entire painting. Uh, some greens, they're also pretty neutral. As you can see here, see all of those trees over here? They are purple. Why are they purple? Well, purple is an awesome bridge between all of the colors. So when you have no idea what color to, 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 to pick, just pick purple. And of course, this entire painting works because of the uh, contrast. Oh, who's this guy? Oh, it's actually me. <laughs> uh, I implement the same principles when I paint my little color doodles. I think I'm proudly proud of this one the most because uh, the lighting in it is, for me, it was pretty complex. But as you can see here, again, 60% um, browns. There's a few highlight colors here and there. And then 10% is the red. And maybe a little bit of the green of the, of, of the, of the guy here. Um, to to emphasize on him and then when I'm creating lighting scenarios in general again you have to understand what what feeling that you're going for so for example here I was trying to go and again those are painted in like an hour and a half to sometimes three hours uh, but here I wanted to go for very light a little bit of a fresh mysterious <laughs> and clean look that he's looking for guidance or he's been lost in the fog and he encounters this magnificent and clean and, and you know, pure creature. So when I was thinking about, again, associative thinking, what clean, pure, and, you know, what does it associate with? For me, it's associated with the color white, right? And that's what I did. I'm like, okay, it's going to be a very high key painting. And then I added a little bit of pinks for some sort of calmness, a little bit of value, uh, you know, uh, difference here and there, or I guess vibrancy. To, so it's not just entirely monochrome. And that, that's another thing, guys, when you have, remember when I talked about if your values are correct, you can use almost any color. So if you, if you look in, in here, this looks like, the deer itself is white, but if you color pick, it's gonna have purples and pinks and, and blues um, and reds, because if you have a value that is similar to other ones, you can go into synonymous colors. And then if they're gonna have a difference between them in hue, that's what creates color vibrancy. When you have slight changes between two hues in a pretty similar value range. So from a far away, this might look, well, if I up the uh, range a little bit, this might look like white, but then if you zoom in, there's gonna be a lot of hue shifts in between, and that's what creates color vibrancy. So every time when you are thinking about your painting and you're thinking about your story, and you're thinking, what do you need to do? Again, you need to think about your value range first, so it works in this aspect. Then you need to think about what kind of associations do you get from thinking about the idea of the main feeling that you're going for. So if you wanna be sad, or you wanna be mysterious, or you wanna make it hopeful, think about the feeling first and see what associations come to you in terms of color. Right, and we talked about them previously. Uh, and uh, then gather reference, see what your main colors are. And again, dissect them to 60, 30, 10% rule. Like for example, here I wanted to have, a not a mysterious, but a threatening looking lightning. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna have probably the main color blue because I wanna make it scary. And that's why I had pretty dramatic shadows here. And then just for variety, again, to my 60%, I added 30% of those greens. And then for the highlight color, I added purple here. Um, and that's it, it's that easy, right? Um, for example, here, pretty, pretty nice uh, example of complementary colors, green and, well, I would say exactly red, but pretty close to red. Everything around is green. It's the most contrasted thing in the painting. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's that simple. 
Um, I'm not gonna go too much more to other examples. Um, and I just I just wanna go straight to this in-depth storytelling. Like for example, here, when we're talking about the mice um, and we're looking at the lighting, of course I came up with the composition first just through line work. And I think I have the speed paint of this saved to my Twitch channel, maybe not. Uh, I think on one day, uh, like a bunch of my watts got deleted. I was pretty sad about that, but it's okay. But here, the story is pretty simple, right? The guy comes out out of a staircase and then he looks at the mouse and everyone is scared and the mouse presents him um, a little flower. And he says, please accept our offering, become our leader, technically, right? And so the first thing that I'm thinking when I'm, when I'm, when I'm thinking about color in general, is the feeling that I'm going for. And the feeling here that I was going for was very cheerful, very attic look like because it's, it's, it's an attic, attic. Um, yeah, and I wanted to have a sense that it's cozy, it's not threatening at all. So what did I do? I don't have super dark spots in terms of like going to pure blacks. Um, I have a lot of fill light, a lot of breathing in it, a lot of sunny colors in it. And then I'm thinking about, for the most part, again, light is there to tell a story through attracting the eye to the right parts, through contrast. So for example, the most contrasty thing is here, 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 and here, right? So we'll look at this kind of like that, and then we'll go in a circle back. Um, and again, saturation. Saturation here also tells a story, and the story is pretty simple. Look here and look here. Uh, that's what the, the hue of his green and the hue of the blue flower um, tells us. It just tells us to look here. Do I have time to come up with symbology of the flower and the blue and everything else? No, because illustration is not always color scripting and then you don't have the, the range like in cinematography and film to train the eye of people to understand what each color means. Um, for example, if I wanted to introduce a color of hope in this whole sequence of many, many paintings, I could have, I could have trained the audience to respond to it emotionally but I just don't have the time to do that. Uh, all right, and I have a few more examples. This is a painting of mine again. And what's the story here? Honestly, this is just a nice looking frame. Uh, maybe not even that nice looking, but <laughs> the colors here are pretty, again, similar. We have 60% of blue, then we have 30% of orange, and I have 10% have of green or red. So or orange and red are complementary to blue. And then green is a highlight color here. Over here, I kind of wanted maybe a little of a mystery. So that's why my values are so dark. Usually the darker and more drastic the value range is, as I told you before, guys, the more dramatic the shot looks like. And it's pretty mysterious because I'm not revealing anything with the light. That's another thing is, Light is there either to reveal compositional things that are important or to hide. And hiding and not revealing something with the light is as important as showing something. Uh, for example, here, um, the, what, what does the light tell us? What does the light reveal? The light shines directly, directly behind uh, the silhouette, reveals him, and then the cross in the foreground. If I was painting this thing now, I would have probably added a little bit of more fog in there to separate the guy into the background. But for the most part, it works, right? And what the, what does the light tell us here? Well, look here, because that's the most contrast, and it looks here, and then we make the connection, A and B. Uh, and we're like, well, the guy's probably having like a faith crisis, maybe, or maybe he's just really stressed out. Um, for example, here, what does the color and light tells us here? Well, the light is very dramatic. So that means something dramatic is happening. Uh, the colors are very saturated. So again, saturation amps up the stakes, makes us uncomfortable. This is a very saturated red, man. Um, and I feel 
the toxicity of the screen uh, complementing the red um, and yeah this the, and because of the dramatic value range see we're manipulating the value of our colors and because it's so dark and so contrasty this image first of all it's dramatic secondly it's very gruesome and makes me feel at ease right um and thirdly it, it, it again it makes me feel very uncomfortable and you know it's it's yeah it's very eye-catching and and it's succeeding that's what they're trying to to say um here's another one which is stormtroopers this one tells us nothing there's just stormtroopers and just nice again warms with that the entire painting is basically this there's a few variation in, in the shadows but that's that's the whole painting it's just two two uh two nice saturated looking cool and warms and again color doesn't tell much of a story here sadly here's more interesting here color um Again, color is there to guide our eye. We look where the most saturation is, most interest is, and the most contrast is. So lighting is there to not only, let's say, tell a specific story, let's say there's gonna be a shadow and then the shadow pointing somewhere, but again, the light is there to guide our eye. So the main contrasts are here, then we go here, and then we'll go here. So there's a triad of things. Let's see what kind of story is in here. So she's just looking, uh, those are her servants probably cutting her hair. Um, this guy <laughs> really is looking at her. I didn't notice that, but he's really looking at, um, say at her hands. Um, this guy is hiding something, right? This guy wants just to touch the princess, but honestly, this is a, just a nice composed painting that doesn't really have, in my opinion, doesn't really have much of a story in it. Um, yeah, it's just really nicely composed. But other than that, it's the main point of this composition and story and color is just to keep things un, un, again mysterious. It's called free food for thought or associative thinking because people when people look at it they'd be like what about this guy who is and they can come up with their own story putting into the silhouette or into this part of the painting and i like this painting a lot why because we ourselves can come up with our own stories and what we're not showing is also as important as what we are showing this one is pretty straightforward uh i think this one has the most story than all of them but again it's really hard to find nice storytelling pieces in terms of color and light uh, here uh, he goes out of a pretty threatening um, environment to a more threatening environment it looks like he's pretty pretty scary trip from be behind to a more scary trip uh, because we we'll, we have the difference between this blue and this orange right um, I think the most um, the best painting that in my opinion works in terms of i would say light itself is the one with the goblins because the light really guides through the story and of course composition itself is a big 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 part of this illustration itself all the guidelines this is not the first time i've shown you this but if we talk about only color and light in this specific um, example. I'm gonna show you an interesting thing and this was my first pass at this painting. When I was just painting it I had two versions. The first version was this and the second version was well the first version was this and the second version was this. I want you guys to look at this and tell me what is the difference and why one looks worse than another. For me, this looks better and this looks worse. And you need to tell me why. One, two, three. Let's, let's see if maybe you are starting, uh, started to say something, but I'm gonna make a little important thing. So when everything is the same saturation, even though if your values are working, but everything is absolutely saturated and there's no desaturation, 
everything is as important for the most part. Of course, this is the most important thing, but there's no nuances. There's no desaturated rest area. As the incredible said, when everyone is super, no one is super. When everything is saturated, nothing is saturated. Again, you need this contrast, contrast between dark and light, light and dark, saturated, desaturated, cool with warm, right? Red with green, blue with orange, purple with yellow, etc, etc, etc. When we are making a painting, we're always looking at contrast and differences. For example, here, as you can see, now what do we have? We have desaturated greens and some oranges here, and then we have very saturated green. So now this pops, but then we look here, it doesn't pop as much. If we look here and we look here, here we look all over the place, but here we look in exact places that I want my viewer to look at. Right. So first thing is saturation that uh, saved my bomb bomb here, because when I just started, uh, woo, uh, when I just started this painting, everything looked like this and just nothing was working. So what did I do? I went in and I painted some neutral colors to make sure that my singing colors or my main focal point colors really, really pop. And again, that's that's the power of saturation or through color to attract eye. Uh, and the story is told through value of the color, right? Again, we have light shining on our main object, which is our main focal point. And then we have secondary focal points in terms of going to the distance. Then we connect to this guy. This guy woken up because this guy stepped on a branch. Then we go to eyes three Woo. and this guy was about to swing on him and this guy that's the fourth one in saturation and fourth one in light is about to kill him then we go to the um dog right and then she or he gruel has saturated um part on him that also attracts the eye and he also has a little beam of light here for contrast so we go to him then we go here sixth seventh eighth ninth and we are achieving all of that through the right control of our value one slider saturation second slider and hue and, uh, and again, here we have some hue shifts and you can call this monochrome, but that's okay. That's the main difference. So this is monochrome, which technically works, but it's too confusing. And this is called analogous. This is when you have pretty similar hues, but you, they still have a difference, right? So yeah, and that's how I achieved the story that I wanted. But first, again, the main thing was figuring out the acting, figuring out the composition, and figuring out the composition through just placing things in the space. But then color and light add value separation, color separation, it brings your previous step forward uh, and makes your story sell even more. Um, yeah, I think to recap, to recap, first is think about your the main feeling. Again, feeling and story. What do you need to convey? Secondly, associative thinking. Associative thinking. What certain colors make you feel? What in certain compositions make you feel? Always ask questions. What does this thing make me feel? Right? And that's going to dictate you towards certain color palettes, right? And again, certain, certain colors, we have associations with certain things. And for certain people, it's different things. But the main associations for all humans are the same. The only thing that you need to remember that if you take saturation away, you're going to have less 
cheer, less of an emotion, but another emotion can shine on top of a just saturation, right? So always think about contrast in terms of value, always try to think about the contrast in terms of saturation, and also try to think of the contrast in terms of hues, and that's where complementary things come in. So if you have a green field that looks something like this, a red ball will look really nice because that's the only thing that is red. Um, thirdly, start blocking in all of your things and then think about the direction of your light. Um, so think about the direction of your light and think about if it's going to be high or low key painting uh, to again emphasize what you're thinking. Um, so if you're thinking it's going to be dark and gruesome, that's probably going to be a low key painting. If it's going to be a bright and cheerful, that also dictates it's probably going to be a high key painting. And that's also going to dictate how you're going to feel about the shot. It's going to be uh, very dramatic and scary or you know, less of a dramatic value range and a more bright. And yeah, and stick whatever you want in front of your lights to use the shadows to create interesting shapes on top of your characters. For example, the uh, how I used it, remember that painting with uh, spiders? I didn't want to reveal the character because I did not have the room in the composition to distract the viewer from the story. And what I did is, well, I created a pattern of their shadows. Uh, and so, Remember when I told you that what you're not showing with light uh, is as important what you're showing with light. So for example, here I'm purposely not showing them, keeping them off screen, but I am with light showing part portion of them. So now the viewer can make up in their own mind in what pose are they standing. Are they standing epically? Are they standing super cool? You know, uh, what does the, their faces look like? For people who just saw this painting, they'd be like, who are those characters? And they would try to come up with them. And again, this is one of the most important things is make sure you leave room for interpretation sometimes in your painting. Because if you can leave, leave uh, in other humans' brain rent free, that makes your painting basically immortal because they're gonna make it so much personal for themselves by, you know, uh, filling in the blanks, right? I did the same thing with, um, you know, with, with this painting. When when I had a pretty weird spider and half of it somewhere in there, then I had a little little uh, red spots here and there, and everything's pretty, uh, I would say, you know, undefined because I wanted the viewer to come up with what what's what's behind it themselves. So yeah, and that's that's the fourth one is. Uh, leave room, don't reveal everything. Right, so leave some room for interpretation. And again, that's what the role of color or of light is. And again, color and light is the same thing. When light shines on anything, we choose to highlight this person in the same, this dark room standing right if we're not shining somewhere we review only portion let's say of a character having you know one of their legs on top of each other and maybe there's going to be a cigarette smoke going like this you know maybe a hat you know we are purposefully not showing what's under the mask because we're trying to not reveal everything but then we when we need to uh, reveal a design let's say of an interesting uh, you know, monkey looking statue. We're gonna shine all of the light on it because we wanna reveal absolutely everything, leave nothing to interpretation. But then behind of it, maybe there's a, there's a horde of monsters that only eyes are showing. And here we're gonna uh, decide not to shine light into there and leave things for interpretation. So yeah, um, that's, that's the main thing. Feeling of the story, you connect to associative thinking, which connects you to the color choices. You think about your main uh, lighting and then where you put it. You think about what you're gonna reveal and what you're not gonna reveal. 
uh, and then you start the painting process, just like in all the other lectures that explained how I usually do it. You just you just do it, uh, and I know that a lot of uh, it's back. I'm back. Woo! Saved, saved by the internet. I'm back. <laughs> but a lot of you people probably thought that um, I'm gonna give you like a formula on how to make a certain shot feel a certain way. But for the most part, it's again, it's all of those principles. It's, 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 it's all of those principles and um, your own interpretation of them and how you use your, these tools, right? And how you use those tools is your own, you know, it's your own responsibility. Where do you want to attract the viewer's eye? What does this color represent to you? Again, in the beginning of the lecture, I said it's all personal. And that's why I said it's personal. For, for, every, for every human being, what they paint and what each color means to them, what they want to attract the human's eye to, it's a personal thing. And I cannot tell you uh, what colors to use and not to use because your different story is different. If you want to create a very cheerful and brightful murder girl who is emitting nothing but good and positive juju, but she merges everyone with a smile on the face. That's your own stylistic choice that I cannot make for you. And I cannot, you know, predict how you're going to use the contrast between yellows that provide interesting associative thinking and then your composition that are going to, you know, prove everybody wrong. Uh, I'm not sure what your sense of blue is and sadness. Maybe for you, it's going to be dark greens or this or that. I can only tell what what colors mean to me. So, for example, when I was um, I was doodling a you know a father uh, and a kid. Remember that little painting of it's one of my favorite paintings, even though it's still pretty roughly done. But you know, for me, the color of sadness is kind of like this green blue. So that's, that's how, that's what I connected to. For some people, it could be, you know, maybe just, you know, something desaturated like this. Every single one of you have their own taste and no uprising that dictates what looks like what to you. So uh, hopefully that with, again, saturation and contrast of saturation, uh, the eye goes to the more saturated things, or if everything is saturated, you go to just saturated things. How are you going to attract the eye towards that focal point? And why did you choose those colors? You only could can answer this for yourself. Why did you put the lighting this way, not the other way? Also, only you can answer this question for your story. Whatever I just talked about, which is what looks more dra dramatic, where the eye attracts, it's only the way to attract the eye to the focal point. But there's so many variables that you have to actually think about yourself that's actually impossible to go over each individual, you know, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, example. So, yeah, uh, hopefully you're still alive. Hopefully this was interesting, but again, color is a personal thing that is developed through time, through analysis of other people and through visual library that you're going to accumulate through your entire life. Main advice that I can tell you is look at something, think about why do you feel about it a certain way and why it makes you feel a certain way. And then try to replicate that in your painting because we as magicians or as painters trying to teleport our viewer in our world and make them feel what we're feeling while we're painting a painting. And if you're not feeling the thing that you're trying to convince another person to feel, that means there's something wrong. There's something wrong with either this or that. You need to find guidance and you need to think about it twice. You need to raise a bunch of questions and hopefully when you're going to answer them, you're going to find the right way out. That'll be it for today. I think now it's time for a few questions and answers. And after that, we're going to go on a Q&A session. So let's go. Hopefully internet is going to be fine. Uh, I didn't, I didn't go out for too long, right guys?
do 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 questions questions let's go <laughs> yeah question 60 percent color is the context yep i would say what i told you before 60 percent color is the context and everything else kind of behaves around it uh okay barely a few seconds that's good didn't even notice okay good uh, which is king composition or colors or other from other lectures or other from other lectures, uh, which is a king composition or colors composition. It's in, it's intertwined. You can have a nice black and white composition, but then you can use it. You can ruin it with color and saturation. So one doesn't go over another. Well, also, well, black and white can live without color. So I'll say composition in terms of line is very important, but color is also very important. I cannot pick and choose. Um, I say this, that it is possible to uh, ruin a good composition with bad colors, but also it's possible to make a bad composition work with good colors and good lighting. So it goes one way or another uh yeah hello friends if you enjoyed oh, okay okay uh if you have any more questions guys any more questions i'm here i'm here let's let's put something nice on for the yeah something like this so it's not that boring um yep yeah. any more questions or should we just dive into q a session right away I'll wait for a few more moments to keep to get people the opportunity. Yeah, there was a pretty um, for me at least. No, not for me, but I did try to explain in the best way possible. Again, I'm trying to <laughs> in five hours. I'm trying to fit in 25 hours of things that I usually talk about on my color and light course on brainstorm. So uh, it's really really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to met jam everything into one um okay so if there's any more there's if there's no questions anymore let's dive into q a session so it could be a little bit more personal uh yeah i'll i'll i'll, I'll cover all those on the q a session itself but yeah guys again story is king you are your own guide for what you're creating and you are your own guide what you connect to emotionally because if you connect to something emotionally it makes you feel something that means you're going to make someone else feel something i'm sorry i couldn't give you a step-by-step -step guide how to achieve greatness through color and light and story but the thing is i'm trying to make you feel think a certain way that you're going to use those tools in your own stories and i'm trying to teach you how to think in a certain way because if you are able to think about, well, what do I feel? How is it going to make other people's feel? And you're going to look and you're going to color pick. You will not stop color picking, not stop experimenting until you will accomplish and until you will find the right combination of things that will make you feel a certain way. And of course, we discussed a little bit about common things that everybody thinks. But again, there's so many combinations and so many contexts and so many stories, so many rule breakings that we can do that it's impossible to cover all those things. So again, trust yourself, be your own guide, improve your visual library by painting, doing, watching. And again, think, think, think and think, why do I feel a certain way? And what's my simple statement? One, trying to get across to the viewer, to the audience, and how can I leave an impression in them through emotion and then you ask what color do i need to pick to achieve that and what lighting does, do i need and then you start brainstorming and it's going to be an amazing exciting puzzle that's going to be very frustrating to, to to solve but over time you'll get better at it and it's going to be awesome okay so uh you guys are the greatest vikings don't stress out i know this is overwhelming but i hope in a good way Right, because exciting horizons are, you know, on on the horizon, and we are, you know, we're we're unstoppable. So yeah, use this knowledge wisely. Hopefully, it's beneficial for everybody. Stay hydrated. You're the best Vikings ever. See you on the Q and A session. Oh yeah.